All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Before I dive in, my name is Rob, one of the pastors here. Happy New Year, and uh, it's great to be with you. Hey, real quick, um, uh, we are starting a challenge on Monday. I got this idea. If you've, has, has anyone heard of the 75-day hard challenge or whatever that some crazy people do? It's like 75 days of like working out and drinking 500 gallons of water and no this. You know, it's, and, and I thought about that, and I was like, you know, we need like a spiritual version of that. So, um, so I created 31, a 31-day 31 challenge. Um, it starts tomorrow. Um, we have bookmarks for you outside in the lobby. If you're watching online, you can go online to our website and download um, the content. And basically, every day there's something for you to do, right? A scripture reading in the morning, a scripture reading at night, a spiritual discipline or spiritual practice. There's a book that you can pick up on Amazon if you want to go through the book. But the whole point is to help us draw nearer to Jesus in this new year. And so if you need a plan, if you need help, um, jump into this 31 days at the table. It's going to be great for us. And so I just want to kind of plug that before I dive in, all right? All right, so I have um, two chairs up here um, because I want to illustrate something. And I want you in this new year to think about you and where you're at with God right now. Like, I want you to think about where is your relationship with God right now? And in this chair, this is like God's chair. So if I called you up and said, hey, come on the stage and uh, place your chair in God's chair, what would that look like in this season in your life right now? Think about that. I mean, some of you, maybe you would say, oh, Rob, man, like, God and I are tight. We're doing great, you know? Like, this is God and me. Like, we're seeing each other face to face, and it, it, man, like, I'm doing great. Some of you, if you're honest, you would say, I don't know, Rob. I kind of feel like this. Like, there's a little separation between me and God. I'm over here. He's, I mean, we're, like, connected, but, you know, we're, we're not seeing face to face or eye to eye. Or maybe some of you, you're like, well, Rob, I mean, if I'm honest, I'd pick God's chair over here. I'm over here, and we are back to back, man. We feel, I feel distance, distant from God. I feel like I've turned my back on him. He's, I feel like he's turned his back on me. That's, that's how I am in this new year. Or maybe some of you, if you're really honest, and you came up here, you would say, you know, God's, God's awesome. He's here. He's doing great. But this is how I'm feeling in the new year. That's me. That's me. I'm struggling. I'm suffering. I'm... I, this is me, and I'm trying to get near to God, but I am just hurting, all right? And so where, if you're honest, as you think about your relationship with God right now, where is your chair, and where is God's chair? But here's an even better question. Where do you want your relationship with God to be in 2022? What do you want your chair and God's chair to look like? Think about that. Because I want to give this illustration because for the next nine weeks, we are going to be studying what's typically known as the upper room discourse. That is John, Gospel of John chapters 13 through 17. And uh, Jesus, knowing that in just 24 hours, he was going to go to the cross, be murdered on the cross. He met with his disciples in a private room, an upper room, and he wanted to make sure these 12 men soon to be 11, men understood some very important things about himself, about his ministry, about just life in general. Jesus was preparing his disciples for life after his death. And so in these next nine weeks, we're going to look at five chapters, and Jesus covers some incredibly important topics. He'll talk about things like servanthood, betrayal, comfort, the work of the Holy Spirit, abiding in Jesus, bearing fruit, how to find peace in the storms of life, and he'll end in John chapter 17, talking about really the power of unity. And so we're calling this series A Place at the Table because here's why. See, wherever you are at this morning, wherever you think your chair is and wherever you think God's chair is, here's my challenge and here's what I believe with all my heart, that God wants to bring you to his table. 
God wants to bring you to his table. And so no matter where you're at, man, he wants to, he's inviting you in the most intimate way to be with him, surrounded by friends at his table. But here's the deal. Not only does God want you at his table, we're going to see in our passage this morning that God actually wants to serve you at his table. So think about that. What does that look like? What does that even feel like? Can you even visualize that? And some of you, if you're honest, you're like, well, wow, Rob, like, how do I even get to God's table? Because I feel very distant. So we're going we're to talk about that. But let me just pray for us as we dive into the word this morning again. Father, we do come to you right now because you are good. And we do pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts and minds that are open both in person and online for everyone watching, God, because right now you want to speak to each and every one of us, not only today, but every single day in 2022. And so we invite you into this room to be with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. And everyone said with me. Amen. All right. 12.30 would be much better than that. And so, because uh, they'll be away. So the first, just real quick, let me do a little quick summary. So the first 12 chapters of John's gospel are mostly about the life and public ministry of Jesus. But suddenly, we get to chapter 13, and we actually get a glimpse right, of, of really what I would call the private ministry of Jesus. So again, in just 24 hours, Jesus will be betrayed, he'll be tried, he'll be flogged, he'll be handed over to be crucified, only to die a brutal and shameful death. And so here's what, how I think about this. Like, if you knew you only had 24 hours to live, like, how would you want to live it? Who would you want to be around? What would you want to say to them? What would you do, right? And that's, if, that's what Jesus was thinking. Like, I man, I, and if you're anything like me, I bet you would want to spend time with people you loved. I bet you would be off of your phone. I bet, right, every word you said to your spouse or your family, your friends, especially your kids, would just be like intentional and important, right? And the same is true for Jesus. So, man, everything he says is super important. And so Jesus, that's what he does. He, he gathers his beloved disciples in this upper room to do some of those things. See, he knows what's coming. They don't know. He knows what's coming. And so he seizes this opportunity at a meal to teach his disciples several different lessons. I kind of think about this, and I have a kid going to college in the fall, and so it's like I envision parents sending their kid off to college, right? It's like Jesus is sharing his heart with him just before he leaves, now, John is very intentional. If you notice, he tells us that the meal that they were enjoying was just before the Passover. That is very intentional. See, um, the Jewish feast of the Passover was one of the most important feasts for the, for, for the Jewish people. Now, now, just so you know, scholars do debate whether or not the disciples were actually eating a Passover meal or not. I don't think that really matters. I think what's important is that John mentions the Passover meal because here's why. The Passover events, just by the way, are found in the Old Testament book called Exodus. And it's the account of God's rescue and redemption of the people of God, the Israelites, out of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt. And so Israelites, right, um, they would use the blood of a Passover lamb, of a lamb, and they kind of painted the door frames of their homes. And so that night, the Passover was, is really the celebration when the homes of the Israelites were passed over by the angel of death who spared the firstborn of every uh, household who was covered by the blood of the lamb. And so for the Egyptians living at that time, it was a horrific night. For the people of God, it was a night of deliverance, right? And so Jewish people still to this day celebrate the Passover with a symbolic dinner. Maybe you've done this before called the Seder meal. Now, for followers of Jesus, we believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection accomplished all that the Passover meal symbolized. Like the original Passover sacrifice, the death of Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, atones for, or that, that word means covers, the sins of God's people. His blood purifies and cleanses our heart, and all that would be accomplished in just 24 hours as Jesus was eating this meal. 
Now that's really important. Hold on to that because I'm going to circle back around to that. See, at this meal though, Jesus does something different. He does something radical. He does something that no one expected him to do. And again, if you grew up in church, you, knew all, you know all about this passage. But, but Jesus taking off his nice clothes, takes the appearance of a servant and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Okay, now, you should know that up until this point, man, it's been a bumpy road for the disciples, right? They often did not understand the significance of Jesus and his ministry. In fact, after 156 weeks, I counted, of being with Jesus, the disciples came into the room arguing about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. We actually know that, not from this account, but from Luke's account of the same story. And so the disciples are arguing about who will be the greatest. They come into the room, and, and they take their customary positions around the table. Now, again, again, I'm not assuming everyone grew up in church or anything like that. The, 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 the dining room table was not like your dining room tables at home at all, right? It was much, much lower. You would actually recline, if I remember right, on your left-hand side. Your feet would be out. You know, you kind of just be chilling and eating, right, and hanging out. That's how it was. There was cushions, but your, but your feet were pointed away from the table because your feet, right, typically were very nasty. And so it was customary for the lowest servant of the house usually a Gentile slave, to wash the feet of dinner guests. Now, just again, in that time, just imagine, like, right, everyone wore basically Birkenstocks or something like that, right? The, there was no paved roads. Feet were disgusting, filled with dirt, animal feces. I mean, all of that, right? Like, just gross, right? Sweat. And so before you ate a meal, you'd want someone to wash your feet. Right? And, and, and no one got pedicures back then, so feet were just gross, right? Like, I don't even like feet today. But... And since they were borrowing an upper room, my guess is that there was no servant available to wash everyone's feet. And here's what's interesting. Everyone in that room knew that their feet needed to be washed, but no one did it. They all knew it needed to be done, but no one got up and do it. I think any of the disciples would have been happy to watch Jesus' feet but for Jesus to get up, to take the form of a servant and wash their feet was just, they didn't even have a category for that. And so as the meal begins, the honored guest Jesus does what no one else wanted to do. He strips down, wraps a towel around him just like a servant and begins to wash their feet. Now, sometimes we read this story and go, oh, how beautiful. How powerful, how poignant, what a, what a great thing. But man, if you were a disciple at that moment, at that time, this would not be a hallmark moment for you. It would not. It'd be incredibly embarrassing. It'd be incredibly shameful. Right? I bet you that room was like talking, oh yeah, pass the one, huh? Whoop, got quiet because it was just awkward because they were embarrassed, Right? They were embarrassed that their master, their teacher, their Lord did what no one else wanted to do. And so thankfully, John tells us what Peter was thinking and what he was saying. And Peter was a big mouth, right? We know that. And so, and so I love that we get insight into what he was thinking. He basically says, oh, Jesus comes and he says, oh, oh, oh no way, homie, right? No, you're not going to wash my feet. Like, Jesus, important people don't wash feet. Kings don't wash feet. Like, you're way too important to do this. No, I'm not going to let you do this. I'm going to go run out. I'm going to find a servant. He'll come back, and he'll wash all of our feet, and we'll just go on, pretend that you never tried to do this for us, because that's not what a Messiah should do. But Jesus lovingly explains to Peter, he says, this has to be done, specifically, he says, because you have no share with me if this is not done. So again, Peter is still not fully understanding the significance of what's going on. So he's like, oh, great. You want to wash my feet? Dude, wash my whole body and start stripping or whatever. Wash all of me. But what's clear, and this is what a lot of people miss, is that Jesus is talking about something much, much deeper than just cleaning physically your feet. Much deeper than that. And what's even more shocking to me, and I think what's even more powerful to me, is that knowing Judas would betray Jesus, Jesus washes his feet 
as well. I mean, can you just imagine how you would respond to the person you knew that was going to hand you over to, be, to the authorities to be murdered? A person who you loved and trusted, who's been with you for months, yet despite the pain and the disappointment, Jesus washed Judas's feet as well. And we're going to look more at Judas next week. I mean, that's just stunning to me. That's amazing to me. Like, but John's going to tell us this. That's exactly what love does. Love is not just a feeling. Love gets on its knees and serves even your enemies, even someone who was once your friend who became your enemy, love serves even him or her. It's powerful. And then as John continues his story, we learn more about the motivation behind Jesus. And two things stick out to me. Maybe you see three or four, but two things jump out to me. John tells us that Jesus was compelled first and foremost by love. By love. Verse 1 says, Jesus says, Jesus loved them to the end. Another translation says, He showed the full force or the full extent of His love. Love was the driving force of Jesus' life. In fact, love will be mentioned. I counted this, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. Love is mentioned 39 times in just these five chapters alone. And here we see love personified, Jesus getting on his knees, serving his disciples when no one else would. Again, this tells me that love is not just a feeling. It's expressed in sacrificial actions. That's the first thing. That's the second thing that I notice about Jesus' motivation is I would say that he was secure in his standing with God. And therefore, therefore able to serve his disciples in love. See, Jesus knew who he was. He knew his identity. He knew why he was placed on this earth. And John actually tells us this in verse 3. We look, at, look at it with me again. He says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, that is a verse that speaks to Jesus' authority. Even though Jesus was God, even though Jesus could do whatever he wanted, even though he had all power, all authority, man, he willingly chose to submit to the will of God. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus was also secure in his identity. Remember, the moment he was baptized, he came up out of the water, and God the Father spoke to his son and said, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Long before Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, long before Jesus healed anyone, he knew that he was God's son, his beloved. And here, all of that comes to a point. He knew who he was. He knew where he was, where he was from and where he was going. The king of the universe, God himself, and one of his last acts on this earth, stripped himself as a servant and lovingly washed the disciples' feet. He's showing us that unlike earthly kingdoms, unlike kings, Unlike princes, unlike all those other people in power, Jesus and his kingdom doesn't rule with an iron scepter. He rules with a servant's towel. And so Jesus served the disciples by washing their feet, and then he served us all by obediently going to the cross and dying in our place and for our sin. So I say all that to say this. This, like, this isn't just like a moralistic, feel-good story about how to be a humble servant, as many make it to be. It's not just that. Yes, it's like, man, if you go on a mission trip, I've done this. It's powerful to wash each other's feet, right? Because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful, and we're on a retreat, so like, do that. It's great. But foot washing actually symbolizes Jesus' final act of sacrifice on the cross, so follow me here. Jesus actually explains that to Peter. Look with me at verse 10. He says, those who had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. Jesus is not talking about taking a bubble bath here. He's talking about what God does in someone's heart the moment anyone places their faith and their trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, God makes them clean. 
And then walking with Jesus, being his disciple throughout a lifetime means coming to Jesus over and over again for deep inner cleaning. Let me put it in the words of theology. You have been justified once and for all. You are now continually being sanctified over and over again. So unless Jesus washes a person clean, he tells this to us, he tells this to Peter, they can have no part with him. See, Jesus doesn't want to just save you. He doesn't want to just give you fire insurance, as I like to say. He wants you to come walk with him, be his disciple, and be his apprentice and follow him. And so if the act of Jesus washing the disciples' feet wasn't only just shocking enough to them, the idea that the Messiah, that the king would die a shameful death by crucifixion and then rise from the dead was like almost unimaginable for the disciples because they like so many of us didn't understand the importance of the cross and Jesus actually said that he said you won't understand all this until later and so King Jesus not only washes the disciples feet but in 24 hours he'll die for them and for us washing away the power and the penalty of sin away forever and that is why Jesus through the writer John is connecting the sim symbolic act of foot washing with the Passover and ultimately his work of salvation on the cross, right? Now, of course, I can't preach a sermon like this and not talk about servanthood because that's a big point, so let me say a few words on that. Um, yes, this is an important lesson about servanthood and about true leadership and true leadership is about serving others yes jesus showed that by his actions that he was called them to a life of servanthood a life of washing people's feet in love and so of course man this means that life is not about getting your own way or trying to be great in your own eyes or trying to be great in in in, uh, in other people's eyes no according to jesus and this is what he says the path of blessing involves a towel, not a title, right? Someone gave me this illustration. I thought it was helpful. Like, we want to be like in like a boxing match, if you watch that, or MMA, right? Whatever you watch. Like, like we want to be the main prize fighter, right? We want to get all the glory. We want to get all the honor, right? But Jesus says, you're not that guy or that woman. You're like the guy who's on the outside of the ring or the woman who puts like Vaseline on the face of the, of the fighter or like washes his or her mouthpiece. Jesus says, you're like that guy. And so Jesus ultimately displayed this by not only washing the disciples' feet, but laying down his life on the cross. And it's just amazing to me, in the shadow of his own death, Jesus served the disciples and then said, hey, this is an example of what the kingdom of God is all about. And I could give you a hundred different real life examples of this from men and women. Um, and I just was thinking about a guy named Dawson Trotman. Is anyone familiar with the work of the Navigators? Can I see anyone's hands? Anyone? Okay. A couple of you. Yeah. Dawson Trotman. Um, it was a ministry founded in 1933. Um, they called Dawson Trotman Dawes. There's a great um, autobiography about his life. Here's a picture of him. Should be behind me. That's him, Billy Graham. And I read a story a couple weeks ago about one of Dawson's uh, visit to Taiwan, and he often went overseas to preach and teach the gospel, and he was hiking with a Taiwanese pastor, and he was in this rural mountain villages, and it was muddy, and it was raining, and uh, he was trying to just encourage the Christians there, and, and their shoes just became just nasty, right? And, and, uh, and later... When, uh, when, a, when someone interviewed and talked to the Taiwanese pastor after Dawson's death, uh, the person asked the pastor, hey, what do you remember most about Dawson Trotman? And you know what the pastor said? He said, he cleaned my shoes. And I was like, wow, here is this amazing man of God who started this incredible ministry that's still going today, and yet this pastor remembers nothing he said he remembered what he did. He cleaned my shoes. And if you read about his life and his story, he loved to serve people. He loved to, 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 to bless people in little ways. Actually, if you read about his life, and spoiler alert, um, he actually died trying to save someone who was drowning. Powerful. 
And so Dawson Trotman is just one example from millions of followers of Jesus over so many years in response to the goodness and grace of God. They chose to pick up the servant's towel, love people, and even lay down their lives for others. It's incredible. Now, what's all this mean for you as we start 2022? That's gonna get hard for me to say, 2022. That's, yeah, that comes off. So a couple people I wanna talk to. One, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ yet, let me just ask you, are you finally ready to come to his table? Are you finally ready to come to his table? Jesus told the disciples, unless I wash all of you, you have no part with me. See, Peter's problem was a very Bay Area problem. Peter struggled, just like so many of, uh, of us, to allow someone to love him and to serve him. Peter, man, he's like, no, no, I want to be the one helping others. Like Peter, like so many of us, didn't realize that his real problem was the condition of his heart. And so if you are going to come to the table, we will need to humble ourselves before God and allow him to wash and cleanse you from sin. And so maybe today or this year is the day for you to come and take a seat with Jesus as he brings you to the table and allow him to wash your feet, right? And so if that's you, if that's resonating with you, at the end of this service today or online, at the end of this service, you can come up and talk to anyone on our prayer team, any of our pastors, any of our staff, any of our elders. We would love nothing more to introduce you to Jesus. For those of you watching online, all you have to do is text us and we'll follow up with you. Or even in the chat right now, write us, right? We want to help you take those next steps. We're gonna have a baptism service in a couple of weeks. We would love for you to get baptized as well. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, right, and I would assume most of you are, we need to continually come to Jesus and come to his table for cleansing. Yes, man, we've been justified by faith. He has removed our sin as far as from the east as from the west. He did that once and for all. But I don't know about you, do you notice that how the dirt and grime of this world constantly sneaks into our hearts and into our lives? Yeah, thank you, John. Like the rest of us are just not honest right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's why Jesus said, hey, the one who is bathed, they don't need to wash. Well, they do need to wash their feet. Again, Jesus is not just talking about foot washing, right? He's saying, no, no, we need to come to Jesus time and time again and allow him to wash us, to cleanse us. Well, how do we do that? A couple different ways. For sure, man, like we wash our feet by regularly reading the word of God and allowing God's truth to cleanse us. If you don't have a regular habit of doing that, your feet will get stanky. <laughs> we need to regularly confess sin and repent of sin. We need to regularly take communion like we're going to do today, a time of where we just do business with God with a community of believers. How do we cleanse our hearts continually, man? We get involved with other people. We walk with people in community, life on life. How else? We actually commit to the local church. We commit to serving there. And of course, man, it's a work of the Holy Spirit that God does in us and through us supernaturally. And so whatever it is you've been struggling with, whatever it is that's been contaminating your heart, man, if you feel unworthy to come to this table today, man, all you need to do today is confess it to God and come and allow him to wash your feet today. One last thing. For the rest of us, just one last challenge. Man, this is not just a feel-good message. Oh, Jesus, wash my feet, right? The challenge is who are we gonna serve in love this year, this week, maybe even tomorrow. See, this is not just a story of what God wants to do in your heart. It's a story about what God wants to do through you. See, disciples didn't just eat a nice little meal with Jesus and have their feet clean and just go on. No, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Did Jesus say you'll be blessed if you pray about doing these things? No. Did Jesus say you'll be blessed if you think about doing these things? 
No, Jesus said you'll be blessed, you'll be happy, you'll draw closer to God, you'll be one of my disciples if you what? Do these things. And so here's the deal, man. If you're going to walk with King Jesus well in 2022, it will require picking up the servant's towel and loving and serving people. You can't just think about it. You can't just pray about it. You can't just have good intentions about it, right? And it, trust me, it's not always convenient. It's often uncomfortable. And sometimes it means serving people who you don't even like, let alone love. But Jesus tells us, man, it is totally worth it. And so again, where are you at in this new year? Where is God at? Where do, you th- where do you think he is at? But a more important question is where do you want to be at in 2022? See, Jesus is inviting every single person here and online. He's inviting you into life with him. He's inviting you to his table And when you get to his table, it's not about you any longer. It's about Jesus because he wants to serve you at his table. And then he wants you to get up and serve others at his table. That's what this story is all about. And that is what Jesus will continually teach us through this series in this new year. And so I'm going to invite up Tim and Craig and the worship team. And we're going to transition now to a time of uh, communion. If you don't have the elements, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and and, and our ushers will get you the elements at home. Right now, run into your pantry and grab some crackers or some juice, some wine, whatever you have, and we're going to transition to this time of communion. And as we think about it, a couple things. First, I just want to give us a moment in this new year to confess our sin to God, to confess the dirt and grime of our lives. And I just want you just right now here and online just to close your eyes and I want you to imagine that you are in that upper room with Jesus and I want you to imagine that Jesus comes to you and starts to clean your feet. You feel the warm water that he's using, the rag and towel that he's using And I want you to think about all the things that are holding you back from your relationship with God, all the sin that so easily entangles, all of your anxieties, all of your fears, all of your frustrations. And right now, through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is cleansing you of those things. How are you feeling right now as Jesus washes your feet, as he cleanses your heart? Jesus is your good, good father. He loves you. He wants nothing more than for all of us to come to his table, to have a meal with him, and to allow him to wash our feet so we can be empowered to go out into the world and show that we are his disciples by serving others in love. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took bread and he thanked God the Father for the bread and then he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's eat together, church. And on that same night, took the cup and he thanked God the Father for the cup and he said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood let's drink together church so Father we thank you for your body we thank you for your blood we thank you God that you came to serve us and you've empowered us to serve others, God. We thank you, God, that you want us to come to your table. You want us to be in community. And you want to not only wash our feet, Lord, but you want us to wash the feet of others. Would you help us to do this? Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for your goodness and your grace today. 
We commit this year, 2022, to you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.